First, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm very privileged to live, work, and thrive on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. And that is where I'm coming to you from today. I feel very grateful to reside here and to enjoy the beauties and the bounties of this place, known, now known as Vancouver. Also, given that land acknowledgements are specific to each region, I wanted to let everyone know that there is a website called Native Land Digital, and the address is native-land.ca for anyone who wants to learn more about the First Nations land on which you're located. So MPA first formed its Equity and Inclusion Committee in early 2019, and a great deal of care and attention was paid to developing our mandate to fit with MPA's vision, which is to grow diversify and promote a competitive and sustainable motion picture industry here in BC. So from our mandate, MPIA commits to promoting on screen and behind the camera diversity because diverse voices must drive our vision and the authenticity of the stories we tell and how we tell them matters. This commitment embraces cultural sovereignty, Canadian representation for the global audience and reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. It is inclusive of, but not limited to, all equity-seeking groups. Our commitment is consistent with our provincial partners, as well as the broad spectrum of government and industry partners who support and prioritize these same values. And it's from this perspective that we bring this event to you today. I have the incredible good fortune to share this space with some truly wonderful, talented, and caring individuals. So before we get underway, I'd like to give some thanks. Thank you first to my co-chair Sue Browse and all of our fellow committee members for their contributions and guidance of our work. And I also want to express deep appreciation to the industry creators and leaders participating today to help us inform, inspire and energize this movement for change. And finally, huge gratitude to Creative BC for their ongoing leadership, partnership and collaboration in our efforts to work for a diverse and inclusive creative sector, sector, sorry, sector broadly representative across creators and consumers alike. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator for today, CEO Prem Gill, leader of Creative BC and a dedicated advocate and agent of change in her own right. Welcome Prem. Thank you, Kendry, uh, for that introduction. And thank you to the committee for all the work that you've been doing this past year and a half. I'm speaking to you today from the traditional and ancestral territories of the, uns of the Coast Salish peoples, the Squamish, Tsleil-Waututh and Musqueam First Nations. Here at Creative BC, we are committed to the collaboration with industry to bring about real change needed, change needed to ensure that BC's production industry provides fair and balanced opportunities across and ultimately representation from across underrepresented groups. As my friend and panelist today, Natasha Tony notes, it's about moving from the performative to the transformative. Here at Creative BC, we have been working with MPA to look at pathways to enter and advance in the industry. And more details on this will be rolled out in the coming weeks and months. At the end of today's program, I'll share some new and evolving web-based resources with all of you. And in terms of what we're doing right, right now, I must say that for many of us, this is not new work. Our sector, like the broader socioeconomic and cultural landscape, operates in historically entrenched practices, protocols, and biases. All of us as individuals have both responsibility and a role to foster long-term change and make a commitment to anti-racism and inclusion. So how the production industry comes together to bring about intentional systemic change in thinking and in practice is a work in progress. There are moments in time where galvanizing events create the attention and will that will lead to concrete action to move beyond the theoretical. And it's been widely understood that 2020 has been one of those moments. However, the systemic racism, unconscious bias and the policies and practices that perpetuate the invisible barriers are deeply embedded in all of our lives. The, assumption, the assumptions about who can and can't do a job, the positive intentions that have negative impacts, the fear of making mistakes or saying something or speaking up and getting it wrong. It is not likely to remove barriers or dismantle systemic inequity unless we all make collective and conscious plans to act on the shocks and insights that, may, that we have in times of crisis. Because seeing what is happening can kindle understanding and accountability. Many within our industry, including those we are fortunate to hear from and speak with today, live the realities of systemic barriers that are part of daily life. 
At the same time, all have persisted in carving out their pathways in our industry, making conscious choices and using their voices to advocate and educate on behalf of those who are still finding their way. While it is not the job of racialized and underrepresent, underrepresented people to tell us what to do and how to fix this, the sharing, listening, healing, and informing is, a new, is enormously helpful to the collective learnings that will help bring about progress. So why are we here and why now? Today, we're honored to explore the questions through the respective lenses, experiences, and personal journeys of our guest panelists. I'm pleased to introduce who they will be. Grace Dove, actor, director, advocate, and youth facilitator. Lauren Cardinal, actor, director, writer, producer, and advocate. Monique Curteau, producer, writer, actor, and advocate. Kara Yarkhan, disability activist, entrepreneurial, humanitarian, and producer. Moira Griffin, producer, writer, advocate, New Bumper and Paint is the name of her company. And Natasha Tony, principal of CEO, uh, principal and CEO at Elevate Inclusion Strategies. So I'm starting, so I'm pleased to start by turning the screen over to our panelists. Each will self-introduce and share their perspectives. And it is with great pleasure I introduce you to Grace Dove. Yes. Over to you, Grace. Cook's Jam, thank you so much, Prem. I would like to open up this panel by introducing myself. I am Grace Dove from Sekwemk, and I come from the unceded territory of Sekwemkulu, Tseskin, and I'm currently based in the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil Tooth peoples. Um, I would also like to explain today that I am wearing a white blouse. It is uh, a Bethany Yellowtail original, which is an indigenous um, Native American uh, fashion designer. It's got beaded handwork around the top and my hair is pulled back and um, I have brown skin because I am a native. <laughs> so now that I have uh, introduced myself, um, I know that we have a brief time tonight and I would like to say that this conversation is such an opener and it's just the beginning. And I hope that you can take one thing and if you can just take one thing and be intrigued and be curious, um, that's all I ask. So today I have four parts um, for indigenous people. We talk about um, the four quadrants and I have a tattoo about it. It's the, the circle of life, it's the medicine wheel. Um, and the first part, and I'm only gonna start 10 years ago. <laughs> so I have five minutes to talk about 10 years. I entered the industry um, uh, as a 20 year old, moving away from my hometown, my community and moving to Vancouver to study acting. And I had waited years and years and years to do this. I wanted to move to LA when I was a young girl. And I asked my dad at about 13, and I was like, let's go, I'm ready, I'm getting old. And, and he said, Grace, he's a teacher. He said, Grace, please graduate from high school and then you can go and do whatever you like. So I waited a long time for this. And I think that you know we are talking about diversity, inclusion, and we're talking about what's not working. Um, and when I first started uh, in training, the problem started on day one, not with the education and not with the teachers, but the lack of diversity and the fact that I never had a person like me that looked like me. I never had a teacher of color. And that's a problem because what it taught me was that I needed to blend into white culture. And that's not okay because it took me years of unlearning that and knowing that the only thing that I can bring to the table that is unique to this character is the fact that I am indigenous and my lived experiences. Um, so if there is not teachers that are available to go into these institutions, then we need to be doing special workshops. We need to bring in indigenous teachers, acting teachers to come in and say, oh, okay, so you're living on unceded territory. Um, even if they're just doing the normal curriculum, it's still going to be different because they have different lived experiences. Um, and when I started embracing my indigeneity. And when I realized that that was one of my most unique qualities, that's when I started booking. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's bring in educators and people that can, that can encourage us and um, let us blossom. Two, once I was done training and I entered the industry, this was very toxic for me. I had such big dreams and such high hopes and they were all crushed because, um, I remember one of my first kind of big auditions, I went out there and I, I, I got to the room and I realized that I looked around and I was, I was the only native person and the whole room was Asian people. 
And that's when I realized, why am I here? Does my agent think that I can pass for Asian? And even if I can, why would I do that? And I, and I knew in that moment, I will never do that again. And I will never put myself in that position where I am sitting around pretending to be someone that I am not. And that goes into representation, which I'm going to cover a bit more um, later. But that was my experience and knowing how uncomfortable that makes me feel. And I hope that people understand. Even if you are ethnically ambiguous, which I don't think they're saying as much, which I'm glad because I don't really like that term. Um, that doesn't mean that we should be playing each other's roles because we don't carry those stories um, in our spirits. Uh, so the reason I was in that room, the reason I was uncomfortable was because our management, we have to be so careful, there's issues there. So for young people, know your, know your boundaries. And it's taken me years and years and years and, and to move on from that toxic relationship to realize that my relationship with my management has to be so transparent and has to be so specific. And they need to know that, that I will not do those type of roles and when they, um, uh, when I say no to a role, it's because I'm uncomfortable and because I'm saying that I don't feel safe going into this situation. And this is specific where um, uh, it encourages violence against indigenous women. So I remember saying no once in this, in this previous relationship. And I remember him saying, but it's really good money after I already said no. And that's not okay because Talent and people that are representing us need to be able to understand that we have our own traumas and, and ex lived experiences. And for me, I don't want to keep living that for other people's entertainment. So, um, so the big one for me is not encouraging violence against Indigenous women. That I'm learning 10 years in. I have a great relationship now. And I'd just like to say, you know, with my team um, here in Vancouver and in LA, I've worked so hard to find people that understand and respect my values as an indigenous person. I really want young people to know that that's out there. If you don't feel safe and comfortable that you need to move on. Um, now, where I'm at today, and I'd like to share one story that can hopefully really just uh, spark some kind of fire for actors. Um, I did a film in 2018 called How It Ends with Forrest Whitaker. And, and I haven't shared the story very much um, publicly because I don't want anyone in the, in the production to feel like I'm calling them out in a bad way. It's more of just like, this is a really important conversation. And there was a scene where um, there's these helicopters flying over and I go, oh, it's a Black Hawk. And I look up and Forrest Whitaker goes, oh, you know your helicopters. And I went, not really. Uh, you know, I just find it ironic that the army named its helicopters after tribes, the way it was written in the script was tribes they wiped out. And when I read that, you know, I went, wait a minute, they're mentioning um, Chickasaw, uh, Chippewan, Apache, they're naming all these tribes that exist today. People that have uh, survived generations of colonial violence and, and, are still here today. And they wanted me to say that these tribes are no, that they got wiped out by the army. And I had already been fighting so many things that day. I fought um, against self-harm scars and I fought for this, this authentic indigenous perspective from this native American character. And so all I did was this, but you know what? I find it ironic that the army named its helicopters after tribes they tried to wipe out. And I just walked away and, and no one said a thing, no one noticed. But after that, I got hundreds of messages across Turtle Island and, and, and Native Americans and First Nations people saying, damn, that scene was so awesome. And now imagine if I had continued the um, erasure of, of Indigenous peoples by not changing that line. And again, this comes back to representation and why if they had hired a non-Indigenous person that looked Native to do this role, they wouldn't have known that that line was incorrect. Um, so, so this is a nudge to not only writers, um, to directors, but also actors, that we have to be in control of these things. Um, uh, moving forward, the future, third chapter, basically. Um, I think that as a director moving into directing, I would really, really like to um, create safe spaces for young people and young Indigenous um, youth, especially, but just young people in general and people who have faced a lot of adversities. 
I think that the most important thing will be that we are uh, telling our own stories, that it is coming from an indigenous perspective. But of course, right now, there's so much interest in uh, other uh, cultures and other people to tell our stories. And I really appreciate that people are jumping on board. But if you are going to tell indigenous stories, then you need to have consultation, you need to have writers, and they need to be in there from day one. They need to be in the writing room. And I see that happening now, but this is still, it's just starting to happen. So if you want to tell a story about my people, if you want to tell a story about Indigenous peoples, you know, bring us on board from day one, and then we will all um, rise together. I think that uh, we need more mentorship. So I'd like to get into directing. I would love to mentor a director here in Vancouver, and it doesn't have to be an Indigenous director, it'd be anyone. We need people in power, especially our, our non-Indigenous, our white folks, uh, our people in leadership positions to be bringing on young people to sit um, and, and watch them. That's all we're asking is we're just asking to be um, in the circle. And, uh, and moving forward, I think uh, my, my final piece is just, I really, really believe for me, storytelling, acting, this craft, this industry, as much as there um, are still issues and work that needs to be done, I think that it is one of the most beautiful um, industries because we, we share stories of resilience, of loss, of beauty, of transformation, and, um, and acting has truly saved my life. And I really want to be a part of this movement. And um, I appreciate everyone for, for encouraging me and encouraging um, this conversation. Thanks, Joe. Thank you very much, Grace. We're going to move to Lauren now. Dante, how are you? Uh, I'm Lauren Cardinal. I'm Cree from Northern Alberta. I live in the unceded territory in the Upper Squamish. Um, uh, it's a fantastic place to be up here. Um, I want to uh, thank the organizers for this, for inviting me onto this panel, uh, and Grace Dove for her wise words. Uh, uh, a lot of the things that she speaks of uh, is the same things I've been going through since I got into this business 20-some um, years ago, it looks like. Um, yeah, and it's still and it's still slowly, slowly progressing. I mean, um, when when I started, um, you know, it was all indigenous uh, characters being directed by non-indigenous people, and um, it showed in the work. I remember doing a show, and uh, the makeup guy went into great detail and research in picking out a face paint for my character. Um, and he and we talked about representation and story. So I added my ideas to this makeup director, and we had this great story of this what it meant, this colors that I had on my face. And uh, we showed it to the director, expecting some feedback and perhaps a little collaboration. He was from LA, and all he said was, "Good, as long as it's different from the other guys." And then he walked away. And we're kind of like, "Okay." So you know, these are the kind of things that uh, we face all the time. And uh, Grace is right. The only way you can change those things is by standing up and saying, no, I will not read that. Changing it from the inside, uh, which means when you read something, you make the choice whether you want to be involved or not. You don't, um, and if you're going to take that on and you don't agree with it, you come with a boatload of ideas to share why this doesn't work, why this is inappropriate, why it's inaccurate, because there's a lot of pan-Indianism going on. And uh and, and the only way to stop that is by educating. So unfortunately, what ends up happening is that you become the professional Indian on set and they come to you all the time for, so you do a lot of educating. It's very, um, it's part of the role. It's, it's part of your responsibility, but it also gets a bit tiring as well because there's so much information out there that if people just had the will or the inclination, they could Google it and find out a lot of the information and come with specific questions, specific uh, to the person or the characters that you're in the area that you're trying to uh, represent in the story. Um, I think because since I've been in this, we've been discussing these issues, uh, the same issues. And even before in my dad's time, my dad and, uh, was involved in politics in the 60s. And they were talking about representation and just basic rights. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a slow, moving issue but i'm glad we st and and the key is to keep talking about it and that's what i love about these panels is because we get to talk about it and educate 
but it also reliant on the participants who are listening as well. So I look forward to people out there um, to come with your questions, your ideas, your notions, and let's exchange information because the only way true change happens is willingness and openness, willingness of mind and heart and openness of spirit. So uh, with that, I would love to introduce one of the um, uh, most incredible women that I know who inspires me daily and has made my life so much better is uh, the beautiful Monique Herto. Great, make me cry. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Lauren. Yeah, wow. Um, um, following, following Lauren and Grace is uh, quite something. I'm really honored to be here right now. Um, there's a lot that's coming up for me. I was talking to our publicist just before I came on and I realized the two things that I wanted to try to keep, keep myself in uh, control with were no swearing and uh, <laughs> try, not, try not to cry and try not to get too angry. This is a really uncomfortable space that we're in, um, but it's important and change doesn't come without going into the scratchy places. Um, so I'm gonna talk a bit about who I am. Um, as you can see, I'm white. I am also French, Irish, Scottish. I am indigenous, I am Métis. I am related, Louis Riel's grandfather is my great, great, great grandfather. I might be missing a great. <laughs> and the current Assembly First Nations National Chief is my third cousin. And I am also status First Nations from Muscawakan First Nation in Saskatchewan. So if you were looking at Facebook with the relationship status, it's like my status is it's complicated. But what I will say is all of it matters to me. I claim all of it because some of it definitely comes with privilege. Um, some of it's complicated. Because I look white, I get to hear the things that people say when they think it's safe. And then I'm, I realize that my white whiteness comes with the privilege, but also with the responsibility of speaking up when it's uncomfortable. And oof, it has gotten very uncomfortable a lot of times. I have been asked, oh, this is hard, numerous times, even lately, to claim only a portion of who I am because it fits their idea of what keyhole they can drag me through. And recently it's been, the, the, the constant is the, I know you can do a lot of other things, but we've got this native project for you. And they don't even care about whether it's something that suits me. And that's troubling. Another has been in a lot of these meetings that have happened recently has been, or these Zooms and panels, people that mistake working with Indigenous people or on Indigenous projects as their right to speak for us. My challenge to people is to think of speaking with us, not for us, to get curious, to ask themselves, are you a part of that group? No matter what the group is. And if you're not, then maybe consider posing things as a question instead of a statement. One of the recent ones, and I will spoiler alert, this is gonna get uncomfortable. I was in a meeting for a very large organization. I'm not gonna name names, but this person has worked on a high profile indigenous project I spoke of some of the challenges as Lauren and I, with our new production company, Through and Through Films, we are moving through things, trying to get through things. It's, there's a lot, there's a lot packed up in this. And I made a statement about business things. I have a master's in business with a specialization in management consulting. I've worked on projects for, for some of the biggest law firms around North America, across the world on projects values anywhere from 75 million to $3 billion. So I'm not, I'm mainstream knowledgeable and experienced. And although I made a statement about what the demographics are, 
and why going international helps because Indigenous people, Lauren and I, often get, oh, did you take it to APTN? Did you do this? And trying to partner us, match make us with other Indigenous people. We already know pretty much everybody. <laughs> we, do, we don't need to be meeting people we know. We need out. We need off of the reserve of creativity that everyone keeps trying to push us onto. We need the opportunity to go partner and meet with people who have access to things that we haven't. And it's not even that it's indigenous specific, it's people who haven't had access specific. So there's that attribution error that happens that people fill in a blank and go, all these people are like this. And it's like, often it's because we haven't had access. You haven't had access to school or funds, or you're living in a place with a boil water advisory. But the other day I made some comments about the challenges as indigenous people in this country and around the world, but specifically here, moving into production and getting pushed to APTN all the time. And the person piped up in the meeting, the person who's worked on a high profile project and said, oh, but it's better for indigenous people now. And I had to smile. Well, I, I could have gone another route, but there's ripples. There's ripple effects if I say anything forthright. Diplomacy, smiling, kind, swallowing it down. <laughs> But knowing that this person saying it's better for us now, maybe they haven't read the news and saw the woman in Quebec who was filming herself in the hospital while she was dying about people in the hospital being bet on to see what their blood alcohol content is. You know, less than 80 years ago, nutrition experiments being done on our people that Canada has the distinction of usually having the place with the world suicide capital, Pigachicum, and that people, I just came up a few months ago, a person challenging how great Canada is, and there are many great things, but there's a long history. Things like apartheid was basically, their role model was Canada, the residential school system, the Indian Act. They thought we did such a great job here of cultural genocide, they wanted to copy it for themselves. And those are some ugly truths. Those are some things that underpin. And when it, when I hear Lauren and Grace talking about how important it is for us to be asked, there's been so much where we haven't been asked and considered. Last, uh, last year, I, I was working on two, two of the truth sharing podcasts that were commissioned by the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. And I knew that I would be moving into challenging territory, but I also knew I was honored to be asked, but I also knew I was gonna be walking into the, the danger zone for myself. And I will always be affected by the things that I heard, but I also know that there were people that I met, some that I met through doing stand up for an honoring our mothers and grandmothers event in Wet'suwet'en territory. And one of them later when I talked to her about, do you know anybody I could talk to? And she started naming off, oh yeah, my cousin was missing, this person was murdered. And she just went through and I thought, how many people can make lists like that? As women, we can all relate to, but the fact that Indigenous women, the harm that we suffer at rates 10 times greater in so many, I'm, I'm going to try not to drill down deep into all the statistics, but the way it's forward, I feel like is to ask questions. There are things that qualitative research, things like CVPR, uh, community-based participatory research, they show success of things when basically ask people what they want and work with them because it's specific. And talking about the pan-Indian, pan you know, I compare Canada's Indigenous peoples to give people a framework to think about is, think of the EU. Would you just put Italians in German and go, ah, you're all the same. We'll just, we'll just get an Italian, it doesn't matter. Do you know your native language? <laughs> and even that in the trends of being asked to audition for things, seeing what Lauren gets often. And it's like, 
it doesn't matter. It feels like it gets treated like the adults on the Peanuts cartoons. It's just a rah, 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 as long as it sounds good. And the fact that culture got ripped away, residential schools, lots of people have lost their language and now it's being treated like it's a, oh, but it's beautiful, let's bring it back. And yet it was ripped away. It wasn't okay a while ago and now we want it back but it was taken and lots of people have lost it. So there's pain even when you're asked to speak a language that you weren't allowed to. That's trauma again. And it, and it feels a little bit, I gotta say it's hard, thinking back of like Tarzan, like an ethnic zoo, putting people inside of a cage and self-congratulating when it's being brought back out again, but because it serves a purpose for them to make money. And so, ask questions, please just be curious. And I will pause it, uh, sorry to go against you Scoots, but do your homework. Don't ask us to do it. Don't ask the people that you're curious about to do the work. There's Google, there's all sorts of resources. Make sure it's not just Wikipedia, question resources, <laughs> but there's so much out there. We're, we're living in a time and age where it's available. It's available. It's out there everywhere. Look at the Truth Sharing Podcast. Do some, yeah, Google searching. Go to your library. Reach out to some organizations that represent the group that you're curious about. And thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Monique. Oh, and I would I have the the uh, privilege of um, of introducing our next speaker, uh, Kara Yar Khan. Thank you. This is Cara speaking from Atlanta, Georgia, USA. Hello, friends. Bonjour, mes amis. Uh, before I begin, I'd like to share a visual and diversity introduction for any of our friends with visual impairments. I am an Indian biracial woman from India, two-time immigrant with a chronic illness and physical disability. I have green eyes and dark brown hair that's tied up. I am wearing a lilac colored dress and iridescent earrings. Behind me is a black wall and black piano with white and gold frame decorations. What you cannot see on the screen is that I am sitting in a power wheelchair affectionately known as Khaleesi for any of you Game of Thrones fans. My pronouns are she and her. Most of my 20 year career I've spent with the humanitarian agencies of the United Nations. Today, I am a disability inclusion advisor and I'm producing a feature documentary film called Her Inescapable Brave Mission, directed by Celia Anaskovich and with the executive producer, the legendary Sam Pollard. I got married four years ago. And when I got married, I thought that taking my husband's name was just an old fashioned romantic idea. But with the plan to stay long term in the United States, we thought that it was best that I hold both Canadian and US citizenship. At the time, I never thought that changing my name would be a necessary move to avoid discrimination. In 2017, our immigration lawyer strongly recommended changing my surname from Yar Khan, which is Muslim, to Masters to avoid prejudice. I felt unwelcome and out of place. My Indian Muslim heritage and my Indian citizenship, which I held until the age of 17 until I became a Canadian citizen, that made me super cool in high school in Toronto where most often I was asked my ethnicity even before I was asked my name. Now, I understand that humans are social animals and a sense of belonging is hardwired in our DNA, just like the need for food and shelter. The audiences that we are making films and television for are from all walks of life. And diversity is so much more than race and gender. That's why representation matters. My life's journey has taught me that. Not just growing up with Indian, Muslim, English, Christian, and Chinese Buddhist parents, but also going to Catholic school and celebrating a variety of different cultural holidays and religious celebrations like Christmas, Eid, and Chinese New Year. I've worked in 11 countries on five continents and speak a few languages, which gives me many moments to experience different ways in which people eat, pray, and love. Now, I am far from perfect. I often find myself doing or saying the wrong thing, in fact. Sometimes I realize I'm discriminating against myself 
because I'm still prey to the unconscious biases and ableist stereotypes that have conditioned us to believe that someone who has a disability or is different in any way is not normal, beautiful, powerful, influential, or successful. In my journey of dismantling discrimination, I extend this to my efforts of being an anti-racist and a feminist. The intersections of my identity, despite checking off five minority checkboxes, Indian, two-time immigrant, woman with a disability from a predominantly Muslim family, does not capture the totality of who I am. There's so much more to us than meets the eye. It is also, it doesn't mean that I'm immune to or not responsible for doing my part in dismantling what the greater collective is saying, doing, or worse, not saying or not doing. In order for to be effective in battling the isms and achieving social justice, we must acknowledge and address that within each group, there are classes of people who are even more marginalized and vulnerable. This is called intersectionality. And the dimensions of diversity are, they're greater than what we think. They actually include gender, ability, class, level of education, body type, sexual orientation, age, nationality, faith, ethnicity, employment, and language. In each of these areas and others, we either hold more power or less power. Those of us who hold more power have less risk. And it's that simple. The inverse is also true as well. Those who hold less power have more risk. And in addition, these social identities do not function independently from one another. They are intersectional. And in all cases, race is a salient factor. Now, I'm not black or white, but I have been conditioned by the power hierarchy that society dictates and reinforces as the norm. Not until this spring and summer's reckoning did I go above and beyond in my efforts to dig deep and put the time in to read and research and walk docu watch documentaries and understand what institutional racism, sexism really means? Where does discrimination come from? And am I complicit if I'm a good person with outstanding morals and values? The answer is yes. We all have implicit unconscious bias and that don't just go away because we think and say we love everyone equally. We all hold prejudice, which compounded by legal authority and institutional control manifests its action as discrimination in the form of racism, sexism, ableism, and homophobia. Unfortunately, as the author Robin D'Angelo points out in her book, White Fragility, the prevailing belief that prejudice is bad Cause is what is causing us to deny its unavoidable reality. It took me several years to come to terms with the severity of my chronic illness, HIBM. It's called hereditary inclusion body myopathy. But being forthright about my diagnosis and all the dimensions of my identity actually opened doors for me instead of closing them. Every sector, every industry has started to wake up to the ways in which representations of certain minority groups affect their inclusion in society. The same is no less true of people with disabilities. And yet, despite our prevalence as the largest minority in the world and the only minority group every human being can become a part of, even for a period of time, we are the most unrepresented, underrepresented people across the board. You would think that with so many of us in the world, disability would be normalized by now. I know equity work is uncomfortable for many people. The discomfort begins when we are made to see and feel our privilege. It's hard work, no doubt about it. But the benefits for our industry and community are exponential. We need to move on from, but I'm not racist, I'm not sexist, I'm not ableist, I'm a good person, into a deeper understanding and willingness to see the systematic structures of oppression that exist around us. Silence and inaction make us complicit. And I, for one, do not want to discriminate against myself or others with my thoughts, words, or actions. So I do the work and I check myself often. I can't exactly remember where I read this, but I really believe it to be true. Being an ally means that when a minority is taking the lead, I stand behind them. I stand beside them when we need to show strength in numbers. And when they are being attacked, 
I stand in front of them. We all have the power to make that choice. And now I pass to Moira Griffin. Hello, my name is Moira Griffin, and I'm speaking to you from Los Angeles, California. Um, I want to obviously acknowledge um, that I am on ancestral lands of the Tongva, the Tatavayim, and the Shumash. Um, I'm really excited to sort of be here tonight. I've, I grew up um, on the border, but um, the border that most people don't talk about, which is the border of uh, Canada and the US. I actually grew up in both countries. Um, I consider myself a multicultural uh, black woman because my mother is from South America. She is from Suriname and Guyana. Um, my, my father is from the United States. I was born in Windsor, Ontario, but right after my birth, I went right back to Detroit. Um, and I grew up going to French schools and I thought I was a, a Quebecois separatist for a lot of the time I was going, growing up only to find out when I went to high school that that was actually not true. Um, and uh, one of the things that I really sort of understood about culture from a personal perspective was that my mother always, you know, sort of put me in front of a mirror growing up and said, you know, there, you're gonna get called a lot of things. And I used to get called names. Um, you're gonna get called a lot of things, but I always want you to know that you are black. It doesn't come off, doesn't go away. Um, and once you accept that, you'll be a whole lot better in life. And um, I always really appreciated that about her because in terms of having an identity or identity crisis, I never had one. And I've met a lot of people along the way who have. And so for that, I am forever grateful. She raised me to appreciate culture because she really believed in her culture and loved her culture. Um, and also within my family, there are people who are you know, who are Indonesian, who are Chinese, who are Indian, who are my great grandmother's native. So there's a lot of different um, people who make up, you know, who we are. Um, and then also coming from a family who's also American and then also understanding the slave trade and knowing in terms of the United States versus South America, what, you know, what the difference of that was. For my mother growing up, she could see people who looked like herself, who were lawyers and doctors and ran the country and her godbrother became a, you know, the president of the country. In the United States, obviously my, my father, um, both of them who had me older, my father was born in 1926. Um, when he went into the army and he was shipped from Detroit down South, he realized that, you know, America was not necessarily a place for him as a black man. And he understood that as an, as an 18 year old and that really shaped who he was going forward. And he always worked um, to make change in the United States for black people. So from that sort of coming up through, you know, different kind of perspectives um, and understanding culture was really important. Um, I'm really lucky because growing up in Windsor, you know, afterwards and also sort of like growing up a lot of people who were, um, who were African immigrants or, you know, from India, my mother was somebody who was friends with all of them, but also started um, the Windsor Women Working with Immigrant Women organization in Windsor. And that was to provide, you know, support and help for women who were newly arrived to the country. So always understanding that, you know, you can see somebody and think that, you know, oh, that person, you know, is sort of driving a cab right now, but you don't realize that they were actually a doctor in their own country. And when they came to Canada, Canada didn't necessarily recognize at the time their papers. So they had to start their whole careers all over. And sometimes what they learned was when they were in universities or trying to get papers, they, were, they would actually come up against a lot of different issues. So in terms of race and racism. So one of the things I've sort of always have grown up understanding was that it is important to be inclusive. It is important to have representation. And representation always isn't always pretty, right? It's not always gonna be these positive, wonderful stories. It's actually gonna be true human stories. Um, and as a, as a diversity, you know, sort of inclusion strategist, as somebody who's also a producer, I believe that we have to learn how to tell real stories about ourselves and about our perspectives. Sometimes those stories aren't always pretty. They're not always going to be the kind of uplifting stories that we want them to be, to have these incre increasingly positive ideas about ourselves, because we are complex people. You know, whether we're Black, whether we're Indigenous, whether we're Indian, we're all of us are from, you know, have different backgrounds and all of us have experienced, you know, different things, pain, joy, whatever. 
Um, so one of the things I always think about is how do you think about representation and what does that look like? Coming to the, the reason I left Canada in terms of, you know, sort of starting my career was I knew it was gonna be a hard place as a black woman. You know, even when I was working in New York and would go to different festivals and meet other sort of people from Telefilm Canada who would tell me that I was no longer Canadian because I lived in the US, right? And they didn't say that to any of the other white filmmakers or white producers, but they said that to me. In fact, they were always surprised that I was Canadian because of my black face. And so those are one of the things that even sort of like sort of living in other places, you know, traveling, you sort of sometimes are always surprised at the fact that other Canadians don't always want to recognize you as one of them. And it's almost like you have to prove how Canadian you are which is the most ridiculous thing, you know? And when it comes to images, it's something that we should not have to prove, right? We shouldn't have to prove that we belong to this country because this is who we are and we've helped to build this country. Um, so as I continue to sort of work and, and work within these boundaries, you know, one of the things that I believe in is sort of not having boundaries at all and really believe in ownership. I think one of the things that, um, that we should strive for as diverse creators, um, diverse actors, is to really sort of think about the, how do we own the projects that we are creating and what does that look like? Because it's one thing to sort of work inside the system and make that system you know, rich and wealthy, but then what does that leave us? And what does that leave the sort of the next generation and how are they gonna be able to create content um, if, they're, if we never actually create our own spaces? So for me, that is really important in terms of moving the conversation forward, right? Um, also thinking about producers. As a producer, you know, I find that you know, we don't get enough support because in the end, we're the people who find the directors and develop the writers and hire the actors and hire the crew. Um, and always we're sort of put last. We're either paid last, not paid at all, not considered at all. Or even when they're developing new grants, you know, I've been looking at some of the new granting that's coming up through um, the Canadian system because they wanna have this, you know, sort of really, we really want to believe in diversity, but you have to have a number of credits before you can even apply. So to me, that means you're automatically excluding a lot of, you know, producers of color, you know, diverse producers who don't actually have the opportunities to gain access to finance the way that others do. So I think there's a number of different ways that we can look at, you know, what does inclusion mean, but also who in the end has the power to make these to make real decisions and what does that actually look like when those people in power are still not necessarily changing when we look at the makeup of a lot of the sort of you know government bodies a lot of the times they're not they still don't represent us and they don't represent a wide sort of variety of thinking so for me there's like i've seen it in the us when it comes to how studios need to change right you know um how independent industries need to change a lot of these the shift that's coming um, they're always surprised that we actually want to make films, you know, with people of color and they they can't actually believe that these things would ever make money, right? That was a sort of saying, even though you prove it and then it makes more money and then they're like, well, that was just sort of an anomaly and then another project comes along and it makes more money. Well, that was still an anomaly. So it's, it is one of those things where I think the more that, um, you know, even as we're sort of proving ourselves, I still think it comes back to the more that we own, the more that we're in the spaces where people make decisions, the more that we are the decision makers. I think that's really where change happens. Um, and with that, I am going to pass pass the proverbial mic over to Natasha Tony. Thank you. Uh, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, listening to you all uh, actually gives me life. I think that uh, it's been a really long year, 2020. Um, and uh, so I, I really appreciate um, uh, your, your shares. So thank you very much. Um, I want to acknowledge that I am coming to you from the unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish nations. And my commitment to reconciliation is to amplify decolonization. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and I identify as a cisgender woman of mixed heritage, which includes British and Irish. And I identify as a black woman with African-American roots. Um, last year, I couldn't tell you that it was by way of West Africa. And I couldn't be specific and tell you that it was Nigeria um, because for me, 
And for my family, uh, my African-American, my blackness stopped at South Carolina, Hartsville, South Carolina, to be specific. And Moira talked about um, the slave trade. And so for me, understanding my history meant taking a DNA test and asking my family to as well so that we could start to understand um, who we are and where we came from. Identity to me is, is key. And it's key being rooted in our identity and, and who we are uh, in having these conversations, uh, whether we're uh, identify as black, indigenous, uh, or non, non, you know, and we're white people, um, racialized people, that you know, finding and rooting ourselves in identity is key. I have brown eyes and light brown skin. My hair is uh, long, black, and curly. And I'm cultivating this lovely gray streak uh, that signifies the wisdom that I've accumulated over the last 50 years. I'm wearing all black with my favorite necklace that's made of aquamarine stone and actually heats up um, with, my, with my body temperature and, and gives me comfort. My backdrop uh, is a blank wall that has been freshly painted with silver gray, uh, which may or may not be on purpose based on my, my new hair that I'm trying to grow in. Uh, I've been in film and television since 93. I actually uh, went to theater school before that uh, as a, a young single mom uh, in Regina and uh, came back out to Vancouver. I was born here. Uh, my parents met uh, just on Davy Street uh, near Celebrities. It's now a, a, an animal clinic, but uh, used to be a commune. And so my mom had uh, moved out uh, from Ontario and she'd had a, a young child who passed away um, and was a young woman grieving. And my father uh, was a young African-American man from Philadelphia who was stationed at Woodby Island uh, at the Naval base and had just done a tour of Vietnam. And so he would come up and party uh, up on, uh, it used to be all jazz clubs. And so they met and I think about my parents, I think my dad was 19 and my mom was 22 or 23. And these were two people in grief, uh, my mom losing her baby, um, my, you know, and, and my father um, trying not to go into another tour. Uh, we lived in Philadelphia for a little bit of time, but I did pre predominantly Vancouver was my home and then moving out to Saskatchewan as a teenager, came back in 93. But the entertainment industry, I always knew that I was going to be uh, in it. I, I remember being eight years old in uh, community center um, and whether it was drawing or, or theater school, I knew that I wanted to do that. And I've kind of had a, a, a love-hate relationship with the entertainment industry. And I say that um, because I've had a lot of success in the industry as well. Um, but it's been one where uh, I started in front of the camera and was told very soon after uh, starting my career that I didn't belong. And so I went behind the camera and I actually was a casting director for many years, casting background for film and TV and predominantly for American productions. But I also went back to school and I did that for about 15 years and as a young woman. So I was probably 26 when I um, started into the casting world. Uh, I left when I was about 40, but I'd put myself through school again and became a mediator, negotiator and conflict resolution coach. And I actually, um, for almost 10 years, uh, spent uh, time uh, doing labor relations for a, a film and TV union. But it was while I was there that I started to understand the impacts um, and I did understand the impacts uh, of oppression being a casting director. And um, I, I recognized again, the impacts of representing um, members behind the scenes around discrimination, bullying and harassment, sexual harassment. And so my third career is now um, training, uh, talking, mediating, doing conflict resolution uh, through my company, Elevate Inclusion Strategies. And I'm still within the entertainment industry, but now I partner with the employer and with the union and with government for us to actually make the, the cosmic shifts. And so the entertainment industry has a, collect, a collective responsibility to examine the legacy of historical discrimination, exclusion, and the harm that it perpetuates. Throughout my career, I have witnessed, advocated, supported, fought for, and have been complicit in my own complacency. 
the negative impacts of ableism, gender bias, racism, fat phobia, colorism, and the ever-present beauty myth are all stories that are alive and well within the creative industries. So alive that many of us have not been afforded the opportunity to thrive in an industry that we love. And I've been thinking a lot about culture shifts and movements. In 2017, um, Me Too with Tarana Burke um, being amplified um, in that movement uh, that was a resurgence um, around Harvey Weinstein and many others that we believe survivors of sexual harassment and assault. We hear about Time's Up and Time's Up the campaign is naming the injustices. We talk about the lack of representation both behind and in front of the camera, limited or no access to funding to create our stories and tokenism and virtue signaling. And who do we continue to celebrate and award? Perpetuating and celebrating the dominant culture repeatedly, hashtag Oscars so white. These conversations that we're having right now are for many of us conversations that date back longer than my 30 year career. And we know that from um, who has spoken before me today. And yet through all of this adversity, I, I feel hopeful uh, that we're actually at a pivotal moment in time. And I like to call it the Jedi shift. And Jedi breaks down into justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And also, of course, we think about Star Wars when we talk about it. But I want you to think about uh, what's happened over these past few months. You know, and here in, in British Columbia, there's the pandemic, of course, and the numbers are alarming. But we also have uh, the pandemic of racial uprising, and we have the pandemic of the opioid crisis, and we have the pandemic of the housing crisis. And so when I talk about justice and equity and what has brought us here, think about it as the motivators, and that diversity and inclusion are the outcomes. So right now, we have an opportunity to create a sustainable future in the creative industries for those of us who have been excluded for far too long. I will remain hopeful if the industry commits uh, and will uh, remain accountable to using that intersectional lens that Cara talked about to transform the systems that continue to perpetuate exclusion. And when I talk about that intersectional lens for us that are filmmakers, think about it from that 360 degree lens. Think about it that we need to be able to have all perspectives when we tell those stories. And we need to understand that the compl complexity of overlapping identities needs to be celebrated. It, it is a rich way of telling stories. And anytime that I get to see a story that is examining and celebrating uh, those complexities, I know that we're, we're moving forward in the right direction. This way of seeing and being takes us, as Prem said, from performative to transformative and where we can build sustainable pathways towards inclusion. And so building sustainability in between the gaps of progress and retrenchment and this is really where I start to think about things where we've been here before and we've been here again and again and over and over. But what happens is we progress and then we roll back. The work that I want us to commit to is what's in the middle. It's that gap. What it allows for us to do is to interrupt it being a moment or a new cycle and actually allows for this to be a movement. And so the time that I spend uh, talking to people in the film industry, um, whether it's 30 people right now in a Zoom room or, you know, what's happened with the pandemic is I can talk to three or 400 people within the industry right now. And so I want to talk about the building of inclusive uh, workplaces. And this is, allows for us to hold uh, one another accountable if we hold these principles, concepts, and ideas when we're having these conversations around building a workplace, building a crew, hiring that uh, you know we're not using tokenism and we're not you know doing the virtue signal, uh, but justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion are not separate concepts. They're actually the core values that bring us together. And inclusive workplaces are innovative. They're collaborative. They're culturally safe, dynamic, and they're great places to work. And think about it when we're on a set that really is inclusive, the, the magic that can happen there. And we need to recognize 
that our universal human needs guide this restorative work because we all want to belong, to be valued, to have physical and emotional safety, and really to be acknowledged for the work that we do. Inclusive uh, workplaces have inclusive leaders who are using their curiosity and humility and courage to, to, to amplify and represent the, the, the underrepresented. They're hiring us and they lead and empower their teams by delegating and empowering and modeling this allyship. I'm talking a lot about intent versus impact within our industry, about unconscious bias and the emotional tax and labor of the microaggressions on people who are considered differently abled. Uh, identifying as female still is an issue within our industry, being black, indigenous and racialized being queer, LGBTQ, two-spirit. And I also want to talk about uh, the men who don't fit within the masculinity stereotype and the impacts that are happening there as well. So most importantly, I'm sharing in the collective grief of anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism. And I tell you that as somebody who is talking about these issues all the time, that there is an impact to me as a Black woman to be able to, and having to hold space over and over, that there's a collective grief that for us here in Canada, the anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism that continues to dehumanize us to and our stories, there's an impact to that. And I try to remain curious of the reactions from non-Indigenous and non-Black people who struggle with their own cognitive dissonance. I'm having the conversations on the impacts of dominant culture through, anti uh, through an anti-oppressive lens, which means I'm spending my time uh, coaching and talking and sharing on how to do this work. And there's a, a racial equity facilitator um, that many people are probably listening um, uh, know of Tema Okun. And if you don't, there's a worksheet out there around dominant culture and doing something else. And uh, in this worksheet, which is fabulous, and it, it talks about dominant culture on one side and how that shows up for all of us. And on the other side, we get to pivot and we get to look at how we can do this work differently. And so when we're having these conversations, we're talking about transformational relationships, building relationships internally and externally that are based on trust, understanding and shared commitments. We're doing transform transformational goals where working towards meaningful engagement with depth and quality to the work that we're doing. And it's holding these systems of complexity you know, I think that uh, talking about this either or thinking that we're either good or we're bad, really, when we're talking about intersectionality, when we're talking about anti oppression practices, that we're understanding the context of intersectionality, and that we're starting to see patterns holding contradictory thoughts and feelings simultaneously. So when I talk about the cognitive dissonance, I want us to hold that in the same way that I want us to hold empathy and understanding that we need to start to collaborate. And I know as creatives that we talk about collaborating, but not everybody's collaborating with us. And so taking time to build those relationships based on trust, doing the relationship building, focusing on um, building and creating something bigger. I think that, you know, we talk about uh, sometimes in anti-oppression, they talk about, um, you know, it's not a piece of pie. People are fighting over this one piece of pie and we're making that pie bigger. But the reality is when I think about building those sustainable pathways, we are, it's big enough for all of us to be walking side by side and along with each other. And so really thinking about this as mutual support and promotion of one another. Community and collectivism. I think that with the pandemic for some of us, there's more isolation and for others, we're starting to click in in a different way. I think that we're starting to talk about how we are and how we're feeling and there's a vulnerability there. I say keep it and keep that kind of self care piece of it too and I don't mean going to go get your toenails painted I'm talking about the self care. I'm talking about feeding yourself walking taking care, but it's also around community care. How are you, what is it that you need, how can I support you actively encouraging a culture of self care and community care in which people care about each other's physical and emotional well being. If we practice this, this comp compassionate curiosity about how race and cultural differences, racial bias play out, that we can do this work 
we don't have to call each other out to do it. It's restorative work when we really think about it. And I think that it's been an interesting process that sometimes, you know, when we talk about restoration, when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about anti-oppression, uh, oppression, that it's not about oppressing one another. It really is about that collective care. It really is about collaborating and starting to understand. And that means you get to have boundaries 100%. But above all, you know, when we do this practice, when we start to, to live within a world of anti-oppression and do these practices, I want you to think about the equation of cultural competence plus cultural humility equals cultural safety. And that we absolutely have a right for that within our industries. I was very fortunate to be awarded with um, the Spotlight Award um, a couple of, uh, well, last summer, it's all a blur, but I think it was 2019. Um, by women in film and TV. And uh, the gift and, and also uh, the award uh, came from Capilano University. And the gift, the award was actually a photo um, uh, that Wendy D took. And uh, there was a beautiful quote that you could pick, any quote that, that you thought of. And I'll leave you with this quote, um, which was on my Spotlight Award. And the Spotlight Award was for, for uh, education within our, our industry. And this is by Angela Davis. I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. I'm changing the things that I cannot accept. And so with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Prem. Well, thank you. That's, I think we can all a round of applause for everybody. Um, I think we are now on a full gallery view so everybody can see all of the speakers. Um, so thank you very much for being so honest, sharing your stories, your perspectives. Um, I've been fortunate with many of you to be able to have uh, group conversations as well as one-on-one -on -one conversations and we're barely touching the surface. And to the hundred plus people who tuned in today, this whole conversation is being recorded. It'll be available on YouTube. Share it with your other colleagues who weren't here. Because I think that is a big important part of this is that it does not end here. This isn't one conversation we're all going to have together. Um, and we have about 20 minutes left and we were, there's been questions that were sent in in advance to us. I think a lot of you answered many of those questions in your remarks. Uh, because uh, you're so awesome and amazing, but also just the thought that you've put into things. And I know a lot of what I've been thinking of these past few months is my own complicitness in anti-Indigenous and anti-Black racism. And I'm a South Asian person who's fair skinned at, that comes with a lot of privilege and a white adjacency that others don't have. And the reason I'm speaking to this is that we all have to, I believe, acknowledge these bits of ourselves and pieces and many of you many of you have in your remarks in order to really start the real work through this. And the key theme that all of you spoke to in different ways was around collaboration. Now this industry is a collaborative process. One person can't make a movie or a television series. And you know with the few minutes we have left, I kind of want to go back, start with uh, Grace again and go around and just talk about that collaboration piece and where you've seen it starting to work well and where maybe, well, obviously there's still a lot of barriers and challenges ahead of us, but I think there are some key things that many of you can share from the youth perspective, from the abilities perspective, um, from the producer view that, you know, what is that? We cannot do this as just this group of a few people here or the hundred or so people who've been listening to us but you know, more collectively and on to major productions. So Grace, um, I'm gonna go back to you because you also describe yourself as a youth advocate. And I know there's many people who've been asking us questions on like, how do we as other young people get involved and have a voice? Yeah, most definitely um, uh, for the youth. Um, and this was a point that I, I had thought of um, that I didn't mention was that we need to be encouraging our young people. We need to be encouraging our young indigenous people um, that there is a place for them and that it will be safe and that they will be represented properly. And, you know, growing up, I knew I was gonna be an actor by the time I was nine years old. And I started saying that all the time. 
And I grew up in Prince George um, in a mainly white public school system. And I faced so much racism, um, so much adversities. And growing up in a, in a, a blue collar kind of mill town and saying, I'm gonna be an actor. I'm gonna go to LA, let's do this. And having people um, laugh and my teachers tell me, okay, you know, as if kind of thing. And I started saying, you know, I'm not strong at science. I'm not strong at math. I'm barely getting by. My parents are getting me tutors to, to get through 10th grade math. But I always said, give me another drama class. Like I need to, I need my creative part of me to be fulfilled. And even by the time I graduated from high school unwillingly, I still had people saying, well, yeah, that's, that's not gonna happen for you. And then going back there now, 10 years later, after I just had my movie Monkey Beach, my first lead role premiere across Canada in theaters in Cineplex across Canada, they pulled over in Prince George for three weeks because it kept selling out. Now everyone's going, we knew Grace would make it. We always knew, she always had the drive. I'm like, yep, yep, mm-hmm. Just like, sure, I know who was there and it was very few. So we need uh, to encourage our young people and tell them, you know, I'm, I'm not the only success story, I'm just one. And, um, and, and then after that, you know, we need to also, you know, there's so many more issues of like bringing things like arts, bringing, um, I, have a, I have a production uh, youth program where we bring acting, directing, storytelling to communities because the truth is our indigenous communities, our Northern communities are so um, ignored and they're lacking anyone caring about them. And why do you think indigenous youth have such high suicide rates in these very Northern communities? Because a lot of them probably are told, you know, if you study hard, you can go get a good job. What does that mean? Why aren't we telling them, what do you want to do? What is your art? What is your craft? Or what is your trade? Or what is, you know, what is it you want to do? Um, so it's really listening. It's listening to our young people and asking them what they want to do and then supporting them. Uh, and I, I, I'm so, so passionate about that because I didn't have that. And against all odds, I had, you know, my parents luckily supporting me, always saying, Grace, graduate, and then you can go do what you want to do. I had, uh, you know, one or two people along the way. But besides that, no one, no one ever said it was possible. So I'm here saying it's possible. And I just want young people to know there's no reason to go and do anything you don't want to do because at the end of the day, like the world is always going to be hard. And even now, you know, after 10 years and after uh, enough success to be uh, a recognized actor, I'm still miserable in my own ways. <laughs> like the world is a very difficult place. And so why would you be miserable doing a job that you don't want to do? You might as well be miserable doing the job you love. So that's really, I don't know if that yeah. answers. It's, it's perfect and excellent. Um, it's again, it's just sharing more experiences that others can relate to. And, uh, you know, I remember I had interest in journalism at one point and people saying, well, we've already got one of you on our as a reporter here, so we don't need another one. So and these are things that you know, from 20, 25 years ago till now that we're still hearing. And I think that's important. Cara, I want to, uh, to go back to you for a moment just to talk about the, you know, it really struck me when you said we could, it's a um, uh, underrepresented group that anybody could become at any point. And I don't think anybody, many of us have never looked at it with that lens before. Um, and that was a really great way of talking to us about it. Um, but, you know, in terms of you know, casting, I know that you've spent a lot of time talking and thinking about this. Um, and it was a question that came specifically um, for you on um, this, the, the discriminations that uh, people are still facing and anything that you wanted to share on that any further would be welcome. Yeah, thank you. This is Cara speaking. I mean, the, the question was asked me, you know, how do we end that full body slate, which serves to age uh, to discriminate against people with disabilities, limb difference, and body shape. And first and foremost, it's about us not being invisible anymore. And I think that that's twofold. There's responsibility on both sides because in exclusion is a result of invisibility. Um, for people with disabilities, we have this wonderful thing called social media and the internet now, and it, we really have seen a wonderful movement of people with disabilities being loud and proud, 
And for those of us who have yet to find our power to be loud and proud as people with disabilities, it's about finding your people to be able to encourage each other to say, we do have a place, we do have inherent value as do all of us. And there are supports out there for us. Um, the disability community, you know, we say nothing about us without us. And if we want to be at those tables or create our own tables, we need to step up to the plate to explain to people that we are capable. You know, I spent the first 30 years of my life without a disability. And when I was diagnosed, my response was one of fear and that of my family even worse, putting limitations on me as to what they think would thought would happen with my international career with the United Nations. You know, this path to give up on life and stay home rather than go and, you know, keep exploring in Southern Africa and onto Asia and back to uh, Central America. And people said, no one will marry you this way. Well, I'm four years in, not doing so bad now, really. Mm -hmm. But again, it's about telling those stories. So in having a film that I'm producing, it's not only about people with disabilities, it's made by people with disabilities. And so I think when we look at, look at the latest scandal right now, I also see it as an opportunity with the film Witches. And bravo to Anne Hathaway for apologizing. But I want to see what she does next in that I love that midsection um, it, that, that Natasha was talking about, you know, what are they doing in the meantime? What is Anne Hathaway going to do in her next film? And everybody who worked on that film about including people with disabilities in front of and behind the camera. When we have a script, you know, Grace so beautifully talked about how she changed that one line, changed everything. Asking the question, where are people with disabilities? And if they turn around and say that this film isn't about people with disabilities or there isn't a character with a disability, how do you know? Because not all the disabilities are visible one, the majority are invisible. And as you said, regardless if it doesn't, that lens needs to be there because disability as mentioned is something all of us, every human being is going to experience for some period of time in their lifetime. That therefore makes it relevant. And it means that we should be leading with this effort of being inclusive for everyone. Yeah, absolutely, Cara, thank you so much. And um, yeah, it is, what will you do next, right? And that's a question to all of us as we're participating in panels and reading the books and, uh, you know, doing things on, you know, using Instagram as a tool, et cetera, but what are we doing at the end of the day? And that's what the questions I certainly know I keep asking myself and, and those around me. Maura, I'm really curious about your uh, Canadian American experience in some sense, um, that you really didn't see a viable career path here for you. And um, I'm sure you're not alone in that. But in the, I guess, recent years, and uh, clearly you've been following things that are happening here in Canada, um, what are things that we can learn from your experience in the U.S.? Because um, there certainly is a strong Black community of creators here, and now there, there's been announced that there will be a Black screen office um, in Canada. Um, but, you know, I'm sure you still see challenges or barriers, but I'm give you a moment to just uh, share if you have any reflections on that. Yeah, I think one of the things that's... Um... I actually even say this to, to, you know, black and brown filmmakers here is really sort of looking at how do you cultivate your audience? I think one of the things that, you know, I might not, you know, love the films and TV of Tyler Perry, but I, I can't not the way that he was able to build an audience for that, you know, for his content and, and an audience that was really sort of starving for it and really communicated with them. And, um, and continue to build on that, right? And and once again had ownership. He, you know, he owns so much of his own product that he was actually able to make sort of, you know, real money off of it and be able to determine his path. And I think that's actually really important for filmmakers and creators. I think that like and Ava DuVernay is also a really good example of that, you know, that also has to do with the fact that she was a publicist for 15 years. So she really understood what that actually meant. Um, and I think a lot of times, you know, people want to create, which is beautiful. You know, we can all sort of create these incredible things, but then what does it mean sort of beyond that? How are you connecting to your audience to make sure that you can create again, right? That's, that to me should always be, be the goal as well. And if you're not sort of your base audience is always going to kind of look like you if you're making stories about them, right? So how do you sort of continue to, to communicate to them 
you know, whether it's through social media or the radio, do you know what I mean? Like there's so many different ways to communicate to an audience. And then how do you think about expanding beyond that audience as well? Because you're still telling stories that so many people want to see. And I, I really also think that's, that's incredibly important. Um, I think the other thing that I really want to address is the fact that, you know, yes, it's great to be a director. Yes, it's great to be an actor. Yes, it's great to be a producer, but there's so many other jobs um, that we don't talk about when we think about what it means to sort of work within this industry. Um, and I think in Canada, because there are so many, you know, sort of film and TV that actually is made there, like what is going on with the crews? You know, who are the gaffers? Who are the DPs? Who are the um, the publicists for the, who are the, who's behind the marketing? Who, like all of the, who are the lawyers? You know, all of these different sort of aspects to what goes into creating content, you know, those are jobs. And, you know, we should all be represented in all of those jobs. So if you don't have, you know, from the PAs all the way through to the, you know what I mean, to the executive, all the way through to the funder at Telefilm, all of those people should be, should reflect, you know, society as well, so. Yeah, it. absolutely. Thank you, Mara. And, I kind of teased it a little bit at the beginning and more will come in the coming weeks and months. As I noted, there is a large undertaking here in BC right now, looking at that below the line workforce, knowing that it's like several tens of thousands of people strong and what are, what are where the work does need to happen. And in all of those roles that you mentioned, plus, 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 and to the department heads and, and where can we uh, continue, you know, as Natasha says, the Jedi work across all of that, but also, you know, what does the workforce look like? Um, Lauren and Monique, oh, I'm going to go over to you now for a few minutes. We've got uh, a little bit of time left, but, you know, Lauren, you have, um, a, a long uh, and amazing career uh, as an actor, and you have uh, probably seen a lot over those years. Uh, but what kind of I um, she just cut out a little. Oh, I cut out a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How about this? Oh, that's good. Okay, sorry about that. I was gonna say, okay, we've got a few minutes left, but I wanted to give Lauren a moment just to talk about what in your amazing career timeframe have you seen that has shifted? Uh, uh, it's starting to slowly shift now into uh, represent, uh, representation of stories, telling stories, our own stories by our own directors. We definitely need more writers and producers. And again, it, it becomes a challenge of where do we get the experience? Like both Monique and I are conscious of it. And when we're building our company, we, we're looking at working with the best people we can find regardless of color or abilities, but just the people that we want to learn from. Because that's the only way to, to raise myself and my experience is by working with the best I can find. Um, I also make choices of not being uh, of roles I turn down, uh, whether if it's you know playing the native dad, I go, nah. I've done that. Uh, I want to play the chief or the police chief, <laughs> not the chief, but the police chief. You know, um, I want to be a, a prosecutor, not not a client. You know, <laughs> I want to be those guys, and 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 that's what I, I keep working towards. And and um, but you know, it's a, it's an uphill struggle, and you have to be aware because uh, there are um, not malicious intents, but there is intents of ignorance, and I mean that in the truest sense, which is lack of knowledge. Uh, I, I did a show on my favorite show, and uh, I was asked to, uh, the line said, uh, I, you know, why? Because I'm a native man. And, uh, and I had to uh, say, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say I'm a Cree man, because that's how I self-identify. I'm Cree from the Cree nation. I come from a long line of, of head men and medicine men and women. So it's part of my Cree nation. So my character is also Cree, so we're going to say Cree. And um, the amount of... Um, pushback I got was from the writers and the producers and the directors saying, no, 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 just, just give us one. Just give us one with the, the way it's written. Uh, Native man. I said, I explained my stance and I said, uh, but I said, okay, okay, I, I will give you one. Knowing that that would be the one they use and not all of my other takes of saying Cree man. So I said, yeah, okay, no problem. Let's do it. So we wound it up again. And I said, Cree man. <laughs> 
And then I just left it at that and I go, no, I'm not going to, because I know the game. I know you're going to, you're, you're going to yeah. do that one. And so, it, and, and using words like, you know, that I find or, or that I know are uh, insulting to other indigenous communities. Mm -hmm. Like they wanted me to say Eskimo. And I said, no, I, I will not say Eskimo. Um, but, and here's why. And I gave, explained to them why. And they were like, oh, well, you know, this joke won't work then. And I said, well, it's not funny. <laughs> it's not a, a joking matter. I mean, I'm not going to say it. I'm going to say this. So you guys go figure it out. Mm -hmm. You're writers, you go figure it out. And so they, they figured it out and they understood. And then they worked it into the next character who says the word, but he kind of apologizes for saying it as well, knowing it's not right, but I think it's this. Mm -hmm. I go, I'm like, okay, you know, you, you make these small changes by offering suggestions all the time. Uh, the, another scene I worked on was, uh, you know, Relic Hunter, when I worked on that with uh, Tia Carrera, who's now a friend of mine. <laughs> um, <laughs> but nice. yeah, but uh, it, it was a scene where they wanted me to say, oh, this is uh, the, you know, this people from Central uh, United States, this indigenous group saying, um, you know, that's, uh, that, go that means the people worried about going to hell. And I, and I said, I can't, I don't, I can't say that because of this, you know, this is a Roman, uh, I don't know what the word is, a Roman Catholic idea of heaven and hell. Indigenous people have no concept of, that's not our concept. That's not the concept of these people. And they were like, oh, well, you know, what then? And so I made a phone call to my brother whose brain, he's got a big brain. He wasn't blessed with looks, but you know, um, <laughs> But he's got this huge uh, knowledge and uh, he came up with this uh, with the term of the great mystery and I went oh yeah the great mystery that's what we we're all a part of we are just a strand in the web of life and so that's what I pitched to the writers and they went yeah okay let's go with that <laughs> so yeah, that's, that's how it changed them again again it's never ending education teaching teaching yeah. teaching so you have to have a, yeah. a lot of patience a thick skin mm -hmm. and um I just wanted to share a story too that fits in with my complete awe and love for this man and what he does in places that sometimes people will not get to hear about. And one of them, you don't need to say the one that you auditioned for, but there's been this trend of, can you say something in your language? I spoke to that a little bit mm -hmm. and that, can you do this and do the dance? And it's just like, so Lauren went in and oh, you're yeah. saying, yeah, tell yeah. me what so, you did. So, I love this. So that was the uh, uh, audition requirement: speak in your native language, or you know, to to show that you that you, you that you're really indigenous, I guess, and a test, <laughs> an audition test, same kind of thing. But uh, so what I did is I sang them a Cree song that I knew, and and I, and I left it there, and I said, oh, and here's another uh, uh, indigenous. indigenous language that I picked up in my travels, and I went into. Now is the winter of our discontent. I did a whole Shakespeare in the Scottish Brogue because that's an indigenous language Richard, as well. Yeah, oh my so, gosh. yeah and, you know, I, I think this is all, um, sorry to interrupt you, Monique, we're just about tapped out of time yeah. here, but I'm loving Grace's reactions to everything you're saying because I think she's <laughs> had the exact same experiences. Um, yeah. But, you know, this is where language is important. And, you know, we have a fortunate Canada that we have. Um, uh, indigenous screen office are the caretakers of the uh, pathways and protocols on working with Indigenous producers and productions and on Native lands. So, um, you know, look at those tools and that's going to lead me to just yeah, in a quick closing. I have a couple of slides with just some resources we're going to share. And, um, you know, again, thank you to all of you. Um, there's so much more to talk about. I think we've just got, you know, several sub panels that we'll be doing based on this discussion. Uh, first and foremost, off the top, Kendry had mentioned uh, this website where you can go to uh, put in where you currently live and reside and work and play and get an understanding of why land acknowledgements are so critical and important part of both reconciliation and, and understanding as many of us are come from settler communities, what that means. So uh, that's the link to that website. Uh, we'll be sharing this stuff after. And uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so if you go to creativebc.com, there'll be a, a 
something on the home page that will direct you to if you're interested. We talked a lot about uh, different uh, reading materials, there's research reports, there are many interesting directories and tools if you're looking for talent and people to work with, uh, connecting with the unions and guilds, organizations. This is just the beginning of trying to centralize these resources and information. Many of them have been vetted and supported by a lot of you on this call, but this is a real opportunity to, um, you know, and feedback that to us at Creative BC as well to start to share and build this along in our partnership with industry. So that's a resource if you're looking for things that you want to follow up on immediately. And then my final slide is just to say that while we were on our call today, uh, the provincial health officer here in British Columbia, Bonnie Henry, uh, has extended some provincial health orders and measures around social gatherings um, and staying safe. And I would say we as a sector and industry have always been leaders in this, but let's continue to and do our part in remaining uh, following the orders. Uh, I know it's really tough, especially around the no socializing outside of your household. Um, if you live alone, I know it can be even more challenging. We have these new tools and abilities to connect and we really encourage you to focus on those. Um, we have a really, everybody has spoken about optimism and opportunity and the fact that you show up and continue to have these conversations is a large part of that. And we want to have a healthy, safe um, and not see um, any more deaths or illness out there. So let's um, do our part. And on that, I will um, end and thank you again to Natasha, Monique, Lauren, Cara, Moira, and Grace, and this adorable dog, um, who probably should have a panel of its own. It's, uh, <laughs> it's terrific. And thank you to MPF for inviting me here today and to everybody it, who's been supporting this uh, in the back end, uh, Leslie, Amber, Kendry, uh, Peter Leach, my colleagues and friends at Creative BC as well. So thank you, have a great evening and please take care of yourselves and each other. Good night.